So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for letting me speak here and also to all the other speakers for a very interesting week. And uh, I will tell you something about my PhD project that I am uh, doing in Prague at Charles University at the Department of Probability and Mathematical Statistics under the supervision of Zbigniew Pavlas. And uh, right now, mainly we are focused on Poisson Lagarde tessellation. So I will explain hopefully uh, well what it is. And then I will tell you a little bit about what we are trying to achieve and what we need to study to do that. So, um, because it's uh, Friday, I will start with some pictures and with something that hopefully you have heard about, which is the Voronoi tessellation. And what it is, is basically uh, a way how to partition the space into cells based on the Euclidean distance. So here we fix some points in space and then we just assigned each of these points a cell of those points from the space whose uh, distance to this particular point, which we call a generator, is smaller than uh, to all the other chosen generators. So for our six points, this is how we would partition the space. And we can generalize this concept very nicely just by considering different uh, mean of distance. So for us, this will be the so-called power distance. And uh, this is a very nice geometric interpretation. So what does it mean? Uh, basically, we take some weighted point and here, let's now imagine it's in R2. So we have X and then uh, we assign some weight to it and it is positive. So we can uh, imagine it as a circle with the radii uh, uh, equal to this weight. And then the power distance of some point Z to this weighted point U is defined by this formula. So we take the square of the uh, Euclidean norm of x minus z, and then we subtract the square of the, of the weight. And so geometrically, what this means is that if we have a point outside of the circle, then the power distance is square of the length of this side of the triangle. And if we are inside of the circle, then the power distance is actually negative. And it is equal to minus square the length of this side of the triangle. So uh, there is some like nice geometric interpretation. And uh, uh, yeah, the one thing that we sort of want to remember is that, yeah, it can be negative. It is always negative for the points inside the circle. Then along the line, along the circle, it is zero. And then outside, it is positive. And so now taking this power distance, we define the Laguerre tessellation, which is weighted generalization of the Voronoi tessellation. So once again, we pick some points and then each point gets assigned a positive weight, which we can represent as a circle around this point. And then we again split the space into cells based now on the power distance to these weighted points. And uh, as you can see, maybe you've noticed already, there are some differences. First of all, uh, it can happen that point generates an empty cell, which here is this uh, red point here. And it is basically due to the fact that uh, there are too many stronger points, so points with uh, large weights that are close to, uh, close to this point. So this point is too weak and it cannot generate any cell. So this is one difference. And the other one is that uh, even if the point generates a cell, it can happen and it, that it does not lie in its that that it does not lie in its cell, which is the case for this green one because this green cell is the cell it generates, but naturally it it cannot lie in it, and that is actually because this whole circle is hidden inside this bigger circle. So whenever we have this situation, this point will never lie in itself. So these are some differences that uh, make Lager tessellation interesting, but also somehow harder to work with than the Voronoi case. And so we can just put everything I just said into formulas. And even though the pictures were in a uh, plane, this concept can be defined uh, in general dimensions. So what we have is a countable set of generators, gamma, which are our weighted points. 
And then for each of the weighted points from gamma, we, we defined the Laguerre cell of X in gamma as the set of all the points from ZD such that the power distance to X is smaller than to any other point from our set of generators gamma. And then Laguerre tessellation is simply the collection of all the non-empty Laguerre cells. So this is the definition of our uh, of our object. And the first question we should ask is uh, whether it is even well-defined. And it is in fact true that for uh, somehow wrong set of generators, the Laguerre tessellation will not be defined. But uh, fortunately, we have uh, from the article by Claudia Lautenzak, uh, Nau Radenbach, and Sergei Zuyev, sufficient conditions for our set of generators so that the Laguerre tessellation it generates is in fact a normal tessellation. And so what this means is that uh, it is a collection of cells that are convex, they are compact, their interiors are non-empty, and they are disjoint. So it is exactly what you would imagine a tessellation is. And this normality basically tells you that the way the cells neighbor is somehow natural, that it is nice. And that is something we do wanna work with, as I will uh, tell you about in a moment. So it's fine. We do know that under some conditions, it is well-defined and we can actually call the tessellation and it is the object we uh, want. And so now maybe the question is, okay, but why do we want this object? What is it good for, apart from being, in my mind at least, a very interesting thing mathematically. And uh, the reason we care about Laguerre tessellation is because it appears in the material sciences. So uh, in material sciences, we have uh, polycrystalline materials. You can see, uh, you can see an example of uh, nickel titanium that is a polycrystalline material. And so the way we can model this is to take a normal tessellation of R3 because uh, the cells are the grains uh, that are naturally uh, inside this material. And so if we want a stochastic model, we want a random normal tessellation. We could do this as a special case of particle point processes, but uh, that's sometimes not so nice to work with. And the reason why Laguerre tessellation comes into place is actually that in dimension three and higher, any normal tessellation has a Laguerre generator. That was uh, once again proven in the mentioned article. And so this is the reason why, in fact, studying Laguerre tessellations is equivalent to studying normal tessellations in a dimension three and higher. Interestingly, this does not hold in dimension two. So there's a counter example for that. Uh, fortunately, we do live in three dimensional space. So from the practical point of view, we are okay with that. Uh, but mathematically, this is something interesting. And so if we want a stochastic model for polycrystalline material, what we can consider is random Laguerre, random Laguerre tessellation. And how do we obtain that? Well, we consider random generator. And the natural candidate for that is something we have already encountered, I think on Monday or Tuesday, which is the marked point process. And particularly we will consider Poisson marked point process. So uh, for the sake of this presentation, basically what we have is a model where we have random points in space. And then each of these points gets assigned a weight, a positive weight, which we call also mark. And this, uh, this, this is done independently of the points, underlying points, and also of the other marks. So the points and marks are independent, and also the marks are independent between itself, because it's a Poisson process, and we have product intensity, intensity measure in this product form. And so the intensity measure basically tells you how many points you get to expect in certain sets. So if we take set B, subset of RD bounded, and we take some set A of our, of our weights, so we can imagine some interval here, then the expected number of points whose like points lie in B and the weights are from A is equal to T times Lebesgue measure of the set B times Q of A, where Q 
is called the mark distribution. And it is exactly what it is called. It is the distribution of the IID marks that we are assigning the points. And uh, so this is, this is the model for a random generator. And uh, yeah, I just want to mention this T because I will get to it later. But basically what this does is it just tells us how many points on average we will see. So if T is low, we will not see a lot of points. If T is high, we will see a lot of points. But it doesn't talk into the distribution into the points uh, in the RD. And because uh, we have this Lebesgue measure here, this is in fact somehow like uniform in a sense. We do not prefer any sets. And so what we call a Poisson Laguerre tessellation, what is our main object, is the random Laguerre tessellation whose lambda random generator is the Poisson marked point process. So as in, the, as in the no random case, we should care about whether this is well defined. And uh, again, unfortunately, we do have a condition on the mark distribution. So if we have suitable moment condition, then we know that almost surely our random tessellation is in fact a normal tessellation. So this is actually an equivalence. We sort of need this implication, but it goes the other way around as well. And so this is something that we want uh, from the mark distribution always. And what we really want to work with is the functionals of this Poisson, tessel Poisson Laguerre tessellation. So these are random variables in this form. Uh, right now we have like some overall points from the process, and then we have some characteristic of the cell that is generated by the point. But because obviously if we took all the cells, we would get infinity, we only look inside some bounded window W. And so here you can imagine the perimeter or the number of vertices, squared volume, and hopefully in the future, we will get even something more complicated, for example, where we would sum over pairs of points and we could like compare the volumes of the cells or something like that. But right now, like if you imagine we take uh, the parameter of the cells, that is really uh, that is really OK. And so to get the exact distribution of T is hard. So what we want to do is to derive center limit theorem for uh, for centered and normalized version of FT. And particularly, we do not want to assume that Q is uh, concentrated on some bounded interval. So really, we want we don't need Q to be concentrated on the whole interval, but we don't want to assume that it isn't. And the reason why uh, we sort of have this uh, have this uh, constraint is because there are some uh, already known results, either for Poisson Voronoi tessellation or there are some uh, limit theorems for Poisson Laguerre tessellation that were derived in this article from 2000, 2020. But because they use the method of stabilization, the assumption of bounded weights was uh, really forced and it is not possible to get rid of it. And you do see this a lot whenever somebody works with Laguerre tessellation that they just assume that the weights are bounded because it does make things a lot, of, a lot easier. And so this is why we wanted to get rid of it because we were trying to make this, uh, make this result somehow more uh, general. And so our idea was that we have this uh, normal approximation on Poisson spaces, which is an article by Lars Pekati and Schulte from 2016. And they used the Malley-Evenstein calculus or the Malley-Evenstein method to uh, derive central limit theorems. And one of the one of the models they used was Poisson Voronoi tessellation and interesting volumes of the Poisson Voronoi tessellation. And so the idea was okay, so we want to take this and somehow use it for the Laguerre tessellation, because uh, it would give us CLT for more general range of uh, models. And also it would give us the um, speed of convergence, which the method of stabilization didn't. Okay, so very briefly, I want to tell you like, what is the main result we want to use? Uh, there is a lot of theory behind it that I do not want to get into. And uh, if you're interested, there is a lot of articles about the Malley-Evenstein method that uh, do a great job of, of explaining what it is. But the idea is to take 
the idea is to derive upper bounds for suitable distance. So here we have the Wasserstein distance between two random variables. And if we derive this bound and the bound is nice, then we can prove that if we take, uh, if we converge to infinity with something, for us, this will be the, um, the intensity of the points, then the Wasserstein distance converges to zero. And if that is the case, then we have convergence of this in distribution. So uh, we have central limit theorem. And so uh, the Wasserstein distance for two random variables is defined as the supremum over a nice set of functions uh, of the differences between uh, e of g x and e of g y. And uh, the upper bound is derived using the so-called difference operators. So we have our uh, we have our Poisson functional, and what we do is we look at what happens if we add a fixed point x to our configuration, how the value of this functional changes, and also we do this iteratively for two points. And so these two are random variables, and uh, in the mentioned article, the upper bound, which I do not have here because it's not nice, is uh, somehow dependent on the moments of these two random variables of the variance of our Poisson functional and also of the probabilities that these two uh, random variables are non-zero. And so now the goal is, okay, take this upper bound, which was derived on general Poisson spaces and prove that for a model, it converges to zero as I said, if we take t going to infinity. So it means we have more and more points. And so to do that, we really need to study how the difference operator behaves in our case. So what we need to study is what happens if we add a point to the Laguerre tessellation. How does it change? Because here we have uh, here we have the tessellation with the added point x, and here we have it without. So it can happen if the point either has a very small weight or it is uh, added in a wrong place that the tessellation doesn't change. So this new point generates an empty cell, then the XFT is equal to zero and we are very happy. But unfortunately, especially if the added points will have a very large, uh, very large weight, it can happen that the tessellation changes. And more importantly, we don't even know how it changes. So it could happen that this new point will generate some cell but uh, no other points will all of a sudden generate an empty cell. So it could happen that all the points that did not generate an empty cell still do not generate an empty cell, and this new point just took some parts of the cells. But it can also happen that it will just eat up some of the other cells. So particularly what we cannot work with is the number of cells, because we don't know how it changes, and we don't have any bounds for it. So. To somehow work with this, what we really need to uh, what we need to work with, what we need to control is how far from X do we have to look for these changes? Because X will not be able to influence all of the points. It cannot. It will only influence like the points in some bounded region. And we want to like study how does this like region changes, which is why we define the distance to the farthest neighbor of X in this uh, Lagarde tessellation generated by gamma and with added point x. And this is exactly what it is. We look at all the neighbors. So neighbor is any point whose cell uh, intersects the cell of x. And then we take uh, the farthest one. And so this is the random variable that we need to study in order to attack the upper bound that the Malley-Evenstein method gave us. And so, uh, what we did was uh, we bounded some moments of this random variable. And to be able to do that, because we didn't want the assumption of bounded uh, weights, we needed some tool. And this tool was the set of tempered configuration. So this definition comes from an article from 2020 by Royal and Zass, and they dealt with the existence of Gibbs processes. And they used it uh, to sort of control the interaction range. And the definition is sort of technical, so I don't want to get into it. But the important thing is that it somehow allows us 
to control the weight. So we can't say it is they are bounded by some constant, but we can say something about them. And that is the key element here. And the important thing is that if we have a suitable moment condition, which for us is unfortunately not the same as for the existence of the plasma character solution, but we do not need the moment to be of order D plus some delta, where the delta is positive. And so if we have finite D plus delta moment of the marks, then uh, we almost surely generate a tempered configuration. And so it is okay for us to only work with these tempered configurations. And particularly, we work with this tempered coefficient, which is simply the first L for which gamma appear, uh, for which gamma uh, lies in the ML, because these set are, uh, they are, uh, they are like getting bigger and bigger, basically. And so using this concept of tempered configurations, what we were able to derive was that a, uh, this tempered coefficient under a suitable moment condition has finite epsilon moment for any epsilon between zero and two. Here we could have also equality. Uh, then using this lemma that gives us sort of non-random technical bound on the distance to the farthest neighbor, which is very ugly, but it is somehow, uh, it is good for us. So using these two lemmas, we were able to prove that the distance to the farthest neighbor under suitable moment condition has finite second moment. And so this is really uh, the stepping stone. And now we need to take these results and to uh, attack the upper bound, which we want to do, and to prove that this upper bound converges to zero. So uh, that is all for me. Thank you for your attention. And here are some uh, references. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, thank you a lot, Martina, for uh, this very, very interesting presentation. Any question? Peter, please. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you. This is very nice uh, uh, talk. I'm, I'm not really sure that I'm super technical to follow everything, but can you uh, point out why do you use this specific kind of tessellation and not the first one that you uh, showed? Like, what is the benefit of using the power distance and not the Euclidean distance? Uh, yeah, so it is really like this part that we have a, we have the whole family of normal tessellations being modeled by this lagger uh, by this lagger tessellation. So for Voronoi, this is not the case. You do not okay. get all the normal tessellations. So and that is really. The normal tessellation is what you said. It's uh, it's like yeah. So the, yeah, oh, you can agree. yeah. Uh, it's so tessellation of R D means that we have cells. They are bounded, convex. They have non-empty interior, and their interiors are disjoint. So this is general definition of tessellation, and then the normality. What what it means in R three is that each of the vertices of the cell is in intersection of exactly four cells. For the edges, it means that they are in the intersection of exactly three cells. And then each of the faces is shared by two cells. So this is the normality. And this is what uh, appears in nature. So that is why we want normal tessellation, because this is how the cells behave in the materials that we want to model. Yes, thank you. And uh, the... The, the coefficient t can you in, yeah. interpret it in the like real world is can you interpret it as time or uh mm, i don't think so it's really just like here it is yeah or sorry do you mean t for the point process not tau right yeah t t in the okay. yeah yeah sorry uh so t no it is more of a Mm, it influences how many points you will see. So, because you, here you have the expected number of points and the T, if it's large, then you will on average see a lot of points. And if it's small, you will see a uh, few points. So it sort of just uh, influences the uh, intensity of the points. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I figured that, but in, in your example of uh, like real world example, uh, yeah. like if, if the T is, you know, like... The, yeah, I think coming, okay. this is more technical because if we want like central limit theorem, we somehow need more uh, observations. So either we can get more and more points or we can take our window and grow the window. And both of these uh, appear in the text. So it is just then in this text, we take like the number, average number of points going to infinity. But this is sort of a technical tool how to obtain the limit theorems because we somehow need to go to infinity with the number of observations. Thank you. Thank you.